Hi, members. I'm Danielle Hobart, Assistant Director of Membership at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's program to learn about Nampeo and the Sipyatki revival. Before we begin, we have closed captioning available for, your, for today's event. To access closed captions, please select the CC button found at the bottom of your screen. We will now begin our program with a land acknowledgement, a statement that formally recognizes and pays respect to the indigenous people of a place. The Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco respectfully acknowledge the Ramatusha Loni, the original inhabitants of what is now the San Francisco Peninsula, and we further acknowledge that the Greater Bay Area is the ancestral territory of the Miwok, Yokut, and Potwin, as well as other Ohlone peoples. Indigenous communities have lived in and moved through this land over hundreds of generations, and Indigenous peoples from many nations make their home in this region today. Please join us in recognizing and honoring their ancestors, descendants, elders, and all other members of their communities. Thank you. Now I'm excited to introduce our two guests today, Bobby Silas and Hilary Olcott. Bobby Silas is an award-winning creative potter reviving ancient designs for his contemporary pieces. He credits learning to make pottery from his godfather, Kevin Navasi. Silas's focus is to revive the technique used to make ancestral Hopi pottery, which he has accomplished through trial and error. He uses the Sitgapki method of firing using lignite coal which he acquires near Antelope Mesa in Hopi. While he is Hopi Tewa, he currently lives in Zuni, where he also practices the Zuni style of making pottery. In 2010, Silas began a decade-long artistic partnership with the late Timothy Edak Edaki, creating polychrome ceramics inspired by traditional Zuni pottery. Silas continues to make award-winning polychrome and traditional Hopi ceramics. Hilary Olcott is Associate Curator of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Hilary is the DeYoung's Coordinating Curator for the most recent exhibition, Frida Kahlo, Appearances Can Be Deceiving, and Co-Curator of the ongoing DeYoung exhibitions of Quartz and Cosmos, Art of the Ancient Maya, and Native Artists of the Western North America in Dialogue with the Natural World. Following the presentation, Hillary and Bobby will take audience questions in a live Q&A. We encourage you all to enter your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'd also like to note, for optimal viewing, please watch the presentation in full screen mode on your computer. This can be found on the top right-hand side of your Zoom screen. Now let's begin. Welcome, Hillary and Bobby. Thanks, Danielle. Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to see where everyone's joining us from. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in today. As Danielle said, my name is Hillary. I am the Associate Curator in the Department of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And um, today I am here with my fabulous co-curator to talk to you about a recent exhibition, a small show that we've just opened at the De Young Museum entitled Nampeo and the Sitkaki Revival. And so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Bobby to say hello, and I'm gonna share my screen in the meantime. Hello, my name is Bobby Silas. I am a potter from Third Mesa, um, and I specialize in recreating Hopi prehistoric style pottery, um, Hopi um, prehistoric style, and um, uh, using uh, traditional um, prehistoric methods of making them. Thanks, Bobby. Okay, so today um, we're going to tell you a little bit about the show that we just opened at the De Young Museum. 
And um, this exhibition is on view. Here we see a map of the first floor of the DM Museum. And the installation is here in this small um, gallery. Here is an installation shot. It features 32 pots from the museum's permanent collection. Um, and while small, it's a mighty show and um, had a lot of work from a lot of different people go into it. So I wanna say a huge thank you, of course, not only to Bobby, um, but also to the whole exhibition um, design installation team. And also I would like to say an enormous thank you to the Weisel Family Art Foundation who made this installation possible and to um, the, the Thomas W. Weisel family and the Paul E. and Barbara H. Weiss uh, family as well, um, who donated many of the pots that we see on view in this exhibition. Um, so the, as I mentioned, the pots, there are 32 works on view. They're all drawn from the Fine Arts Museum's permanent collection. And uh, they span several hundred years of creation. The earliest works were made about the 14th century. Um, and then there are works that were made all the way to the 21st century. So this installation um, really kind of celebrates Hopi, pottery, but also focuses, of course, on the work of the famous Nampeo. So Nampeo um, is arguably the most famous Pueblo potter of all time. She's remembered for her skill as a potter, but also, um, and perhaps more so, for her ingenuity as a designer. Because rather than looking just at the styles that were popular of um, at her present time, she looked to the past and she popularized a style that is now known as Sitaki Revival. Um, so while she, she was absolutely, she's absolutely famous now, she's widely collected by museums and enthusiasts around the world. But in fact, in her time, she was also an incredibly well-known potter and her work was collected far and wide. Um, so we, are going to tell you a bit about the show, walk you through our exhibition, but we're also going to tell you a bit more about Nampeo's life and her artistic practice. So um, Nampeo was born in um, first on First Mesa in Hano Village around the year 1860. And so here we see two different maps of Hopi. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Bobby now to tell us a bit more about Hopi. Yeah, sure. Um, Hopi is located on uh, three different mesas. Um, you have first, second, and third. Um, all have about three villages villages that are inhabited um, on each of them. Um, and where um, and where Nampeo is from uh, is first mesa, um, which is uh, Hano. And below each of these mesas, um, there are usually ruins. Um, sites um, that are located below. So example for Polaka, our first Mesa area uh, would be Sikyatki ruins, which, which would be located at the bottom. And then you have second Mesa, um, and then the ruins would be located um, below there as well. Um, and uh, the Hopi uh, invited the Tewa people a long time ago to help them um, fight off uh, during raids and, and other things uh, when they were having problems with neighboring villages. And in return, the Hopi gave them a portion of land, um, which would be Hano. And um, that's where Nampeo's descendants came and um, lived with the Hopi. And um, Nampeo got her inspiration from um, the sites located below. Um, the villages. So Sikyatki would be uh, a ruin located below First Mesa where um, Nampeo um, got her ideas for her pottery. And Bobby, why did people move from those villages up onto the mesas? Um, they, they were having problems with like raids and um, neighboring tribes would come in and uh, like they would kidnap and just certain things like that. So, and um, raid the fields and stuff like that. it just got really dangerous for them so the people um moved up to the top so um it was a little bit safer for them to kind of uh, watch their surroundings and so they moved up on top of the mesas for that purpose and what does hano mean in hopi hano is a 
um, and Hopi is uh, the word for Tewa, um, uh, for the Tewa people that came to live with us. And I, I believe my aunt told me that it was from Oke Wenge or something like that. Uh, uh, the descendants from that area came. That the Tewa people moved from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so here we have a photograph of, um, of First Mesa, and here we're looking down First Mesa, and Hano is in the foreground. This photo was probably taken about 1940. Obviously, it's taken from a plane, <laughs> um, so we know that it's not that old, but it, it, is, it is a historic photo. Um, and so Hano is in the foreground, and um, what can you tell us? What else can we see in this photo? Uh, yeah, you can tell each... Uh each village. Um, so First Mesa is really uh, un really unique because it's one Mesa, but it has three um, consolidated villages on it. Um, and the first one you can tell by the, the plaza area um, by each um, village. So uh, Tewa uh, is right there. And um, then you have Sitsumovi, which would be middle village. And um, you can see by their plaza area and then Walpi uh, way in the back. Uh, which is uh, one of the oldest inhabited places um, to this day. Um, I think, and that follows with the Raibi as well. Mm, in, uh, oldest continuously inhabited villages? Yeah, continu yeah continuously cool. inhabited. So here we see the road up to Hano and it's been widened at this point. It was probably narrower during Nampeo's time, but we can see her house is right here um, next to the road. And here's a kiva, right? Right next yeah. to that. Yes. Um, so we can take a closer look here. Um, we see a much older historic photograph of uh, Nampeo and her brother, Thomas Palaka. It was taken around 1875 and it's one of the earliest, if not the earliest known photograph of Nampeo. Um, and she lived in a very pivotal time in, in Hopi, in, in Hano village. It was a time when a lot of um, Anglo uh, archaeologists and kind of explorers were coming to visit. And so um, she was a very popular subject and we're fortunate now to have many photographs of her throughout her life. Um, but she is also, so not only was the, their house was right, kind of one of the first ones that people encountered as they came up, um, but also her brother, Tom, Thomas Palaka was a, um, an interpreter and guide for many of the people coming to visit. He was multilingual. He spoke Hopi and Tewa as Nampeo did, um, but he also spoke Navajo and some English and Spanish. So when people came to the village, uh, they would go see Tom and um, they would meet Nampeo. So we see the, the pair and actually their father is cut off in the full photograph. You can see their father next to Nampeo. Um, but they are on top of the Corn Clan house. And so um, Nampeo went, inherited this from her mother and lived her whole life here. Um, and we can see um, Walpi in the background there and um, way fewer structures <laughs> than in the earlier photo. And, and what else uh, can we see in this photo, Bobby? Uh, yeah, uh, this is Nampeo when uh, she's very oh, young sorry. in age. Um, she has her hair in uh, unmarried uh, fashion with the squash blo blossom hairstyle, um, uh, which indicates she's uh, still a maiden and um, but eligible for marriage. Um, but you can see it kind of has gone down <laughs> because they would wear this hairstyle for, I think, a, a couple of days before they would take it down and then redo it again. So this is um, at the end of the hairstyles life. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and um, go ahead. Uh, and then, yeah, and then you're talking about clans and stuff like that. So the corn clan house has, um, you know, each house that's located in this plaza area. Um, has a pretty important significance to it. They all hold religious um, responsibilities um, and that goes all the way around. And um, uh, my family's uh, house is located in the back side um, behind Nanpeo and that's the spider clan house in the background. Um, but um, these, uh, um, so each, each clan has a, a, a purpose uh, for why it's there and, and, and uh, 
um, holds a strong responsibility to the community. And so why would um, Nampeo have, um, and can you speak a little bit about kind of this, the structure of Hopi and Tewa um, family? I mean, it's a matriarchal group, right? Yeah, so a, a lot of the homes, they're, um, the home is usually run by the woman and the, the, the house and everything is usually uh, by the, the woman's side. And then the men are responsible for taking care of the families like, and um, going planting and then hunting and um, just tending to the fields um, all the time. And then the, the ladies will be at home and uh, doing the, 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 the corn grinding and all the preparations for daily uh, feeding and stuff like that. And, and, and then also you have uh, religious responsibilities too that are, was always common back in that days. And it was a, uh, in the yearly cycle, it was uh, uh, every, every month was like a, a busy time for the village. So there was always something going on. Um, and that was, uh, the men uh, had a big part in playing that and the women do as well. And the different mesas kind of have different, or in that time, perhaps more so, had different sort of crafts, goods, wares that they would make, right? Yeah, yeah. So first, second, and third, they all have like their own distinct crafts. And this was like, uh, uh, this is something that they, uh, that the Hopis kind of had an agreement with. And, and it's just uh, so that way, I guess there's no fighting over what belongs to who or whatever. But um, Third Mesa does their uh, wicker plots and the weaving and kachina dolls and stuff like that. And then Second Mesa does the coil basketry with the yucca and the grass. And then they do kachina dolls and textiles as well. And then Polaka, First Mesa area, um, they're known for their pottery. That's like their thing is the pottery. Um, and it to me, it's like that comes first is the pottery and then the, the textiles, uh, men do. Um, then the sifter basketry is something that's there. Um, so uh, they do have kind of like their own um, art forms that uh, kind of belong to the, the village. So Nampeo, um, she like, you know, she likely learned pottery from her mother, um, White Corn. And, and I'll say that this as well, people, you know, there's a lot of discussion about Nampeo and um, her biographies are all written after her time and sort of through research and through um, interviews, but there are disagreements. And so uh, some people say that she surely learned from her mother um, and would have learned a Tewa style, more utilitarian wear, but she also, some say that she learned from her um, paternal grandmother who lived in Walpi. And um, regardless of who taught her, Nampeo certainly saw this Walpi style and Polaka style um, polychrome. That was really the popular style at the time. So the first case that we have in the exhibition, which I accidentally gave away a second ago, and I apologize for that, um, is um, an example of the kind of pottery that Nampeo um, would have seen this Walpi polychrome. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about it, please, Bobby? Uh, yeah, sure. So the water jar on the left-hand side is a great example of Walpi polychrome. Um, um, you can um, you can tell uh, Walpi polychrome because it's white slipped in and it has the red bottom. They use like the white, black, and the red. And, um, but then they're kind of sticking to, um, in this pot is a great example of that they're kind of still kind of sticking to uh, the traditional kind of the sikyaki kind of designs with the bird motives and the prayer feathers um, that you can see going around the bird. Um, and this is a, a really good example of Wapi polychrome. Um, and then you, uh, and this is something that she probably grew up seeing because Wapi polychrome is very uh, distinct uh, uh, pottery. Um, when when you when you look at it, you can just it's it's different from uh, the rest of uh, First Mesa's uh, pottery. Um, kind of sits alone over there, and the end like Wapi does. <laughs> and um, and then you have. Um, then you have trading going on um, during these times as well. So you 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 then with trading you get in, um, in inspiration. So you see a lot of these pottery artists um, 
uh, you know, they trade different par- um, pots from like Akama, Zuni and stuff. And then they incorporate those kind of designs in their pottery. So this middle jar, you can kind of see how it has a flower on it. Um, this sort is of. like a very kind of, yeah, on this side. It's around the corner. Like, You'll have to go see in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, you can kind of see the, the flower um, and that's very Akama style. But then here you have um, Hopi sim- symbology um, on, on the, the jar, but then it has that Akama shape as well. Um, and you have them white slipping it as well. Um, but uh, here you have uh, what Nampeo did a lot was like that eagle tail with the bird. It's, uh, it's just, uh, it's, uh, it's like an essence, a, a spiritual essence of a bird uh, flying into a cloud house. Um, and, and why uh, Hopis use uh, birds as uh, um, messengers, um, you, you, they use them, the men use them on prayer sticks and, and things because that's how um, we believe that our messages will, will get to the spirit world in, in, with that bird um, as the messenger. So this is how um, pottery artists have, um, women back then didn't make prayer sticks. So how they incorporated this into their, their pottery was through symbology, through painting and stuff. And, and so it's like a prayer from um, a female perspective. Um, and, uh, and then they show the bird tail and then the wings um, partially flying into the cloud house. Um, on the top part, as you can see, and then it has a uh, little uh, break offs of like um, uh, cloud uh, cloud motives on the side and, and prayer feathers hanging off. Um, and that's the bird delivering the message as he's going into the, the cloud. Um, and then the pot itself kind of mimics the cloud um, in general. So it holds water just like a cloud. So the, the jar, just in general, is, is like a, a, a Hopi, uh, representation or they mimic a cloud and, and using it as a water jar. And then as you drink from that, that's like the, the prayer that you always want is that water that always that water because that's the environment we live in is, is a, we're a dry farmer. So for our ceremonies, we need uh, the corn and for the corn, the corn eat rain. So it's uh, rain is always an important prayer in, in Hopi life. And it's a, a great example of it here in pottery. Yeah, and I love that this this middle pot shows use too. I mean, you can see that it's been a ladle's hit against it to get water, right? Or a dipper. Right. <laughs> and here's the next case. And can you tell us a few words, Bobby, please, about why you selected these pots to put together? Yeah, uh, so this is a, uh, I chose a, the Wapi Poly Prom C jar on this side. Um, it was a great example of, of kind of how they're sticking to that um, sikyaki kind of style and and probably this is just uh, maybe somebody out some someone out seeing the shape and form and wanting to create that as well but you can see the design layout is very uh, in the wapi style um, um, pottery design motives and stuff and um, with the black red and white des- um, uh, layout and then you have um, another example of uh, inspiration through trading um, and then you have a water jar here with a, a deer or antelope, should I say, inside a house. And that's very uh, a Zuni kind of uh, uh, pottery symbol. If anybody knows pottery from the Southwest, uh, Zunis are always known for their deer, deers or uh, um, deers in the house. And this is a great example of uh, inspiration through trade. And then you can see them trying to grabbing different um, aspects of um, sim- symbolism from different uh, neighboring tribes from like the eastern pueblos and and just taking a little bit of it but still incorporating in their own way and making it their own it's and then you see product. that as well with the yeah and you see that as well with the canteen with the, the zuni um style rain crooks um i i love this case and one of the things that doesn't really come through in all these photos is of course they're very three-dimensional works and um, and this design is so beautiful because you can really kind of look around the pots. And so I encourage you all when you go to see this installation um, to really do that, take a look around. And, and this first pot um, on the left in the photograph is very cool. I, I encourage you to peek underneath it because you can see that it was used, um, it was started using a basket rather than a bowl in, as in this, the case for the other pots on this, 
um, installation. And so you can still see the striations of the basket underneath. So I love that detail and I encourage you to take a peek when you go see it as well. So rather than really just looking at these and following the style of these Walpi poly and Palaka polychrome um, pots that were being made um, before and during her time, Nampeo instead looked to older styles of pottery and she would go walking near First Mesa and um, she would see fragments of pottery that were on the ground and she started um, kind of extrapolating and um, and uh, adding to these designs and creating her own aesthetics. Um, and actually, Bobby shared a photo. Of, you can still find these kinds of ceramic shirts laying around the ground today, right? So this is a this is a photo that Bobby shared with us. Quick aside. Yes, uh, this is a great example of uh, things that uh, uh, shirts uh, shirts that she might have seen. Um, as she walked around kind of exploring. Um, but this is a great example of uh, stuff that you find in, in Hopi land and, and, and it's an inspiration to her and many potters as well, uh, like myself. So, um, but it, in the 1890s, um, archeologists arrived and began excavating um, at Sitkyaki in particular and began excavating entire jars. And so they started pulling out these wide, low seed jars. Um, so Nampeo began to replicate those forms as well. And we see in this photograph, uh, a great example of her really iconic style work. On the left, we see the eagle tail fellers, this really exaggerated saucer shaped seed jar. Um, so not only was she sort of creating these um, new styles, she was um, she revived this ancestral form, and that looks like a really hard form of, of um, pottery to make. Yes, uh, this shape is a, a, a major in engineering accomplishment. Um, it, it takes time, and um, but the whole um, the whole purpose for the pot being uh, in that saucer shape um, is actually pretty neat, and it's it's pretty smart of the people to think of, but. Um, it's to keep mice from crawling up onto um, and getting into the, the pot so that way the mice don't get in there and eat the seeds. So the people are pretty smart in making these saucer shaped jars so that way it prevents the mice from kind of climbing up and uh, it makes it more hard for them to get inside and getting the food, so. Genius. Um, and also this photo, I mean, it's a great example of Nampeo being photographed at work, but also how she's um, was staged by a lot of photographers because she's painted, she's painting a fired pot in this photo, right? Right. Um, yeah, actually, she's she's pretending to like paint a, a pot, but it's, I guess it's like the photo setup. Like he's like, yeah, pretend to paint this, but um, the actual the actual pottery that um, she's already painted and is probably ready to fire would be to her left, but our right. Um, <clears throat> that's what the pottery looks like before and um, the, the big jar sitting there is what it'll look like after it's completed. That's very cool. So in the installation, we can see the pots all together and um, you can really kind of pull out her sources of inspiration. Uh, you can see these design motifs that she is looking at and then creating her own um, patterns from. And I love that about this display. And I also love the the beautiful ancestral wares that we have on view. And, it, and it's really special to have such a large collection of these ancestral wares. And here's one of the cases. Um, and we, you hear the term sitgyaki, but we're gonna use the term instead, um, ancestral Hopi yellowware. And it's because these pots were made in, in different times. And so this case actually um, is, is a great example of that. And Bobby did a wonderful job selecting these pots from our collection. Um, and so it's, it kind of speaks in a few pots to the fact that this time was an amazing time of um, kind of ceramic production and innovation in Hopi. And um, the earliest pots on the left were made in about the 14th century. And then the later ones were made possibly as late as 1600. So can you tell us a bit more about these works, please? Uh, yeah, I, 
um, I thought transition was like a, a very, uh, a, a, an important thing. So that was something that I really wanted to show the people too, was um, the evolution of Hopi pottery. So I picked the, the Jedito, uh black on yellow, which would, it would be called, but it, it's just because of the location where it's found, um, which would be near Antelope Mesa. Um, and then you have um, the middle pot in the middle um, center bowl, should I say. Um, and that's when they kind of start adding color. Um, but it's still coming from the Antelope Mesa area, but it's made, made for specifically for uh, uh, a certain village. So this one is called Bidahochi Black on White. Bidahochi Black on White. Um, and this one is uh, two colors. And then you have the Awato view, which is like with the red. Um, and then they start you know, kind of like uh, experimenting with colors. And then, um, so you can you can see th the evolution of the pottery as it's going. And then later on they take off and then they, they start creating these really elaborate um, uh, polychrome with the yellows, uh, golden yellows, reds and um, blacks and, and whites as well. And, and then creating really abstract designs and then taking off them. And, and this is a great example of a Sukiyaki polychrome or Hopi yellowware. And um, yeah, that's a great point. Um, so we hear these names that you just said, Jedito, um, Birahoji, Sukiyaki. They're, um, we use these terms. These terms are kind of applied by archeologists and um, based on the original locations that these types of pots were discovered by the archeologists. Um, however, it's, it's not, they weren't necessarily made at that site and they weren't restricted to that site. They were, these, pots were hot commodities in their time and they were widely traded. And so they're actually found in a variety of locations. And so um, that's why we tend to use the term um, ancestral Hopi yellowware as a wider sort of um, more inclusive um, description. Also, I mean, Jedito is, is now, is that Navajo land? Is that right, Bobby? Yeah, it's located in the valley um, above um, or below below Antelope Mesa. Um, Antelope Mesa um, on the south side uh, would be uh, where all the villages were located along the, the edging of that Mesa on, on Antelope Mesa. And then below um, in Jedito Valley, um, I think it kind of goes up to a little bit on the, goes up south a little bit. And uh, that's uh, the community that the, the Navajo is named, um, that, that area when the land was given to them. So, um here we have this really phenomenal polychrome style, um, this Sikyaki kind of style. And um, yeah, what do we see going on here? Yeah, um, this is a great example of uh, Sikyaki polychrome finest. Um, you have them, um, they're very artistic people and, and then they have, they're doing, um, almost similar, I would say, to Kiva mural style designs, but they're, they're very abstract and, and they have birds, um, feathers, uh, uh, ceremonial symbolism, um, and, and even just everyday life. Um, uh, like the, the bowl on the right hand has two people standing be behind a textile, which is um, a very good example of uh, just kind of giving us a glimpse into um, of the time back then, like, um, you know, so giving us a glimpse of what their textiles looked at. So it's a very, they were very uh, visual people when it came to uh, painting um, uh, the, um, their surroundings, you know, um, the, the, the life around them, you know, they put it all into their pottery. And incredible artists too. I mean, this one on the right here, I just am always struck by how difficult it must have been to paint something so rectilinear and geometric on such a, a round circular, you know, soft um, pot. I, it's just an incredible piece. What, how do you interpret the symbolism, the design on there? Um, the designs on uh, that one is, uh, you can see uh, the big red, um, triangular designs on the bottom that's a that's a cloud and it has black in there um, to kind of show aggression because in Hopi way uh, uh, we believe that clouds um, 
um, they can actually also be aggressive because they're cloud beings. We believe that, you know, they're, they're just like, because they're, um, Hopis believe that everybody are clouds. So, um, and that's um, what we believe. So, you know, we believe that the clouds can also punish us as well. So um, the, there's like a striping, it looks like teeth kind of going around the pot, but it tells a story of different clouds in different stages. Um, the prayer is on the top because you can see the feather motive on the neck of the jaw. And then it has a breaking point um, in between the black and white. The black and white usually symbolizes like a rainbow and that rainbow is um, kind of there. In, it's in layers, but it's telling the um, in Hopi way we we believe um, in, in in the balance of of uh, of everything. So, you know, you the black and white is put there. It's a rainbow, and it's telling the clouds to stop. You know, at a certain time. You know, um, because Hopi's. Uh, you know, we we believe, like I said, that the clouds are, can be aggressive and they can also cause floods and stuff like that. So Hopis believe in that balance. So you want, they put that uh, rainbow there to uh, tell the clouds to stop because you don't want to have too much. You just want just enough. So that way, you know, to enough to plenish the earth and, and not too much. So you always, uh, Hopis always think of that balance in, in, in everything like in, like that, like the pottery it shows a great example of that. So it sounds like that these pots are very kind of carry similar messages to the Walpi polychrome that we looked at um, from later times, that these kind of prayers for rain and um, messages to the to the heavens. Is that right? Yes. Yes. It's like, a, you know, a, like the jar is like holding a, a prayer from the person, you know, um, you know, asking the clouds for these blessings so that we um, the corn will grow and we'll have you know, abundant life, you know, of, cool. of corn and everything. <laughs> so here we can see um, kind of Nampeo's version of the design. This is one of those gorgeous eagle tail feather motifs. Um, so she didn't sign any of her pots. So how can we recognize her style? Yeah, so this is, um, her style is really, I mean, uh, when you look at Nampeo's work, I mean, I know I could I could tell her work because of her her one drag you know with the paintbrush brush um, you could just tell like she just did it once and then went over and then her coloring was a uh, light light lightly done like a like a watery kind of uh, paint like just enough to put the color on there but you know nowadays um Hopi's, uh, they put it where it's almost solid but back then it was just like to to kind of get the picture, you know? So you have her with the colors and, and then her hatching lines, but her one drag is which, which is uh, really unique because you can see it even all the way around her, her pots. And, um, it, uh, you know, it, it's not like how it is now where, where potters, um, they go over it maybe once or twice, you know, to perfect it. She was, she was just, you know, making it, you know, her own style, but very fine work. Incredible. So she wasn't outlining it. She would just freehand her design on there. Yeah, pretty much. Phenomenal. That's, that's really incredible. Um, so since we've kind of started talking about her technique, here are um, some more photos of her working. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'll say that they're not organized in terms of chronology. Um, they're organized in terms of process. Um, so here we see her forming pots and like other Pueblo potters, um, she uses the, the hand coil technique. Um, can you tell us a little bit more, please? Uh, yeah, so um, you have her here creating a, a jar, um, that saucer shape that she's known for. Um, and then you have her with the bowl sitting there and it has her water in there and then her canteen, which probably is holding her water. Um, and, and it's a great example of her uh, uh, creating her pottery um, uh, in the shape form, uh, you know, the sukiyaki kind of shape, you know, her inspiration, you know, you can see her where she, she's going with it with these. And uh, the jar sitting next to her too is, uh, I think a replica from a old sukiyaki jar as well. So you can see that her, her inspiration is just, it keeps going and she's, She's still creating these wonderful jars and you and using the the coiling method, as you can see here on the um, the right. And so, where would she have gotten her clay? 
Um, Hopi clay is um, actually not pretty hard um, to find in the Hopi mesas. It's usually in between um, rock beds, um, like about maybe halfway through the mesa. It depends. Um, you can find surface clay as well. Um, um, but all are, um, they can turn all different colors. They can turn more yellow. They can turn more um, white. It depends on where the person gets their clay, but and the iron in the clay too. So uh, the iron in the body is actually, um, which can also make a big difference in how the pot comes out. And you can see that with her pottery. Um, she has pieces that are white and some that are yellow and then some that have this, that orange and all those blush colors. So she's, she's getting clay from different areas. Um, and um, she, I mean, what, how, what form does she find it in? Um, Hopi clay can be found in um, uh, kind of like a rock kind of um, form. You can have to dig it out from uh, the mesa wall or if it's in the ground, um, you, you just pull it out, but it comes out like in chunks and like, like a rise. And then you just break it down with a, uh, a grinding stone. Well, back in her day, a grinding stone or matate um, mm. and mono. Um, uh, but nowadays some people um, have uh, found easier ways of um, producing clay using um, just breaking down the clay in a bucket of water and then straining it and then mm. letting it sit and then it'll be be ready in a couple of days. So um, the techniques have uh, um, have changed, but um, the, the coiling method is, is just something that Hopi potters still um, practice today. So it sounds like there was a lot of work that went into, um, you know, even making this this photo, even to getting this point in her process. Right. And so right. here we have further down the road um, and she is painting here and firing. Um, so what would she have used to paint her pots? Yeah, Hopi pottery is um, made with uh, several different minerals. You have your black hematite stone, your red iron oxide, um, your yellow ochre, and then your, um, your kaolin also, which is a slip um, that like uh, Wapi uses for a, a white slip, but also can be used as a paint as well. And that's what, something that they were doing in the, um, the prehistoric um, times like Sikiaki, they were using all those colors, even the yellow. Um, Nampeo would be using um, the, probably the yellow ochre and then the black hematite stone. The hematite stone requires a binding agent, um, which would be um, tansy mustard or, mm -hmm. um, Rocky Mountain beeweed plant. And when it's boiled down, um, it's, um, and then they take out the plants and the juice um, is reduced to create like a molasses kind of a candy. Um, and that's what's kind of broken off when it's dried and put into a pellet and then grounded down with the, the, um, the uh, hematite stone. And, and that what, that's what makes the black paint for um, the binding agent for the hematite to stick to the pot. Wow. And then she'd use, what kind of brush would she use? Um, and then the painting would be done with um, yucca, yucca fiber, um, yucca plant. Um, and then the bristles um, are usually picked from the center of the plant. Um, they pick them from the center um, for brushes um, because it doesn't hurt the plant so that the plant will, will keep growing from the center. So they just take the middle ones and then they stay straight, the yucca from the middle. So they like to use those middle plants for um, brushes because they stay nice and straight and they don't like curl up or nothing. They'll stay straight and those are good for making like nice lines and stuff. So hope we um, use the yucca brush um, to create their, um, their outlining and then coloring in. And are those the kind of same materials that um, the ancestral Hopi artists would have used as well? Yeah, um, yeah, the, I think it was mostly done um, with that. Um, uh, and then um, nowadays, um, some people have incorporated uh, 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 the modern brushes, uh, white meshes, um, artist brushes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, me, I still use the yucca plant and stuff like that because um, it just it 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 works better. Um, I mean, if you develop a a feel for it you know, it just works good for you. And that just comes with being a potter as well. Very cool. And so here we see her firing, right? Can you tell us a bit more about it? Sure. Um, this um, style of met 
this method of firing is actually a, a historical kind of historical form of firing. Um, this was introduced to us um, by the Spanish, um, I, I think when they came back around the 1600s. Um, um, by then, um, they were still coal firing and, and but then when they bring in the domesticated sheep and then they teach us this new way of firing, it's a lot faster. And, and then um, it, it still fires at, at a high temperature. Um, and then, then the people just kind of um, uh, leave the coal and then they switch over to this uh, historical met method of firing. And then um, they're raising the sheep and stuff like this. And so this is, has become more abundant to them. And so, um, especially way back in the day, they, a lot of people were um, uh, sheep herders back then. So um, this has um, became like, I guess, a, a nowadays a, a traditional method of firing, um, uh, but uh, it's actually a historical um, form of firing. It's a newly, newly uh, introduced firing method to the Hopi. And her hair is, is probably wet, right? To keep her kind of cooled down. Yeah, so it's a very, it's, it's very hot dealing um, with this um, firing. Um, it's, uh, you know, building the fire before you, you're just messing with fire all the way through it. So, um, you know, and just to keep you cool through the whole thing. And, and it was probably done on a hot summer day too, as well to intensify it. So keeping cool is a very important thing, especially when you're out there dealing with fire and keeping your hair wet, wet you don't want it to get, you know, singed. Because I've had, I've had that happen. I've had no that one happen. wants burn hair. <laughs> um, so we're going to kind of speed through the end here to have save some time for questions. Um, but Nampeo passed her knowledge on to her children. She had uh, three daughters who lived to adulthood. Um, and this is her oldest daughter, Annie, healing. And pretty much as soon as Annie um, was old enough to hold clay, she would have started working with her mother. Um, and she really uh, followed her mother's designs. They, they worked together. Um, and neither of them signed their pots. And I'm just going to speed through this one, Bobby. Oops. Yeah. And okay. um, here we see Nampeo's youngest daughter, Fanny. Um, and she's, she's almost 20 years younger. And we see that Nampeo is quite an old woman at this time. And she would have lost her eyesight by now. She lost her eyesight to trachoma. And so she was still forming her pots, but she was no longer painting them. And we can see that unlike Annie, Fanny really kind of... Um, embarks on her own style. She, she uses some of these family motifs, um, but she really, she changes the form of the pots and um, she kind of creates her own aesthetic. And so here, let's talk a little bit more about that in this installation photo. Um, so we see four generations of Nampeo's descendants represented here. Um, on the left, we can see an example of Annie's work. And it's very similar to Nampeo's, but it is distinct. Can you tell us a bit more, please? Yeah, um, Annie's kind of sticking to the shape and form like her mother's doing. Um, but she's bringing, um, you know, the reds into the inside of her pots and she's starting to polish. Um, and then nowadays, that's what I think a lot of Hopi potters follow is like that polishing of the reds. So um, yeah, it's a the pottery red. starts to change. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, and then, but she's still following her, her mom's technique with the eagle tail and, and the shape and form and, and then the longer neck. Um, and then you have Fanny, which um, she has totally created her own um, style of pottery. And then um, Nampeo um, was kind of known for her, her, um, her line work, uh, her, uh, her, her cross fine line work. Um, yeah. But then you, yeah, cross hatching. And then you see her daughter, Fanny, here. She's kind of breaking away from that. And then she creates her own kind of style of, um, of like, oh, I'll make it like this. And she grabs it, the yucca brush and she starts doing a stippling and like a kind of like a foggy in of the design and, and creating her own style. And that's with the designs as well. And, um, and more of a, a, an upright jar shape. And then next to that, we have um, an example of De Dextra Kutzkwaiva's work, and she's Annie's granddaughter. And we can see that she's incorporating family designs, but into a really contemporary aesthetic. The surface is different. Also, you can't tell from this picture, but um, there is a nick out of the neck of the jar. 
Um, and on the right, we see a pot by Jean Sami, Dextra's niece. And again, we can see that she's incorporating some family designs. We see the feather motifs, but um, she, she's kind of making it into a different style and form. Right. And then you have, uh, I think it's Jean Sami. Mm -hmm. um, then you have her uh, creating almost this, you know, the same saucer, sa saucer shape. Um, she's doing the sukiyaki kind of style designs, um, but uh, making it in, in a very nice um, painted um, layout. And, and as time goes on, um, collectors start to come in, um, people, co collectors of, of Hopi pottery. So, and, and with that, um, you know, comes, you know, requests for, you know, making them perfect and, and nice and stuff. So you see a lot of um, um, artists kind of, um, kind of perfecting their painting. Um, for the art market. So you can see how um, the pottery has uh, still has this contemporary kind of style, but still sticking to that traditional um, style of their grandmother. Yeah, it's very much, much an art object. Um, and we see that here in this last case and her Nampeo's legacy continues today. And um, this is one kind of further generation represented. And unlike previous examples, these pots were all made by men. And um, you can see that they each are upholding family legacies and styles while creating their own unique, bold uh, aesthetics and these really fabulous art objects. So while this exhibition is small, um, it has a lot packed into it, as you can tell. And um, we hope that you take this with you, this knowledge with you and go see the installation. Um, and just to give you a little bit more background, we're gonna end on a technical note with some photos that Bobby has shared with us. Um, so, He's mentioned a couple different kinds of firing techniques during this presentation and has shared some photos of his work with us. And here um, we see a Hopi style sheep manure firing similar to Nampeo's technique, right? Yeah, this is uh, just the, this is how um, the Hopis would kind of, uh, they practice this style today. Um, they uh, build a fire first and then lay down the sheet manure, put the pottery in. And it's a very quick kind of firing. You have to be fast at it before the manure ignites. Um, and then you, you know, cover the rest of it kind of in a beehive manner. And then uh, I mean, it's, and it's a shorter firing it takes about maybe uh, several hours. Like four, three, two, how many? About four, four to five, I would say. Okay. And so now pay four to five that hours photo if, we... You know, it's a person's son. Go ahead, sorry. No, I was saying if the person's not in like a, a rush, you know, the, they'll let it cool down, you know, and then they'll, they'll take them out. But some people, they, they take out their pottery when it's still hot. So Nampeo, the photo we saw, hers would have been covered. She was still in the process of kind of making this beehive shape. Um, and here's another example. This is a Zuni style firing. Right, this one is done. Um, uh, in the same form, um, kind of with the sheet manure, but uh, it's uh, it's separated from the pottery about maybe a good, maybe three inches apart from the pot. And this is just to keep the pottery um, white because um, Zuni pottery is known for their white pottery. And so like Hopi pottery is known for their blemishes and all that, those beautiful blush marks and stuff. So the manure is put closer. So Zuni pottery is known for that white. So it's, it's, it's put farther away from the pot. So that way the pot comes out nice and white. So this is another good example of um, what the Spanish introduced to um, the Pueblo people. The sheep manure firing. And here's an example right. of this lignite coal firing that um, the ancestral Hopi artists would have used. Yes, uh, this is a longer process. Um, it takes about when, um, when I fire a pot, uh, from beginning to end, it's uh, a 14 hour um, process. Um, and that's just for one piece. Um, that's um, starting it is about two hours. Um, and then the com combustion of it takes about maybe another seven, seven hours. And then, then it reverses down to its coolness. And that takes about another uh, several hours. And so the whole process I counted, I think was about 14 hours for, you know, just one jar to get finished. That's incredible. But it yields, yeah. I mean, it clearly yields a very different type of pottery. It looks like the texture it's, is pretty different. It does. It does. It kind of has like almost like a more solid kind of color, but um, the, 
the design kind of, it has a different look to it, definitely, for sure. Yeah, and this rich yellow hues, it really reminds me of that ancestral Hopi yellowware in the exhibition. So thanks so much for sharing these photos. They're very cool. Um, yeah, and definitely. thank you all for joining us. The installation opened um, when we reopened in February and should be on view until 2023. So um, you have plenty of time to go see it. We hope that you do and take these this little background knowledge with you. And we also hope that um, you're inspired to learn more. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we look forward to um, answering some questions. Thank you so much, Hillary and Bobby. It's such a wonderful presentation. We have lots of questions to go through and you've already answered several of them. A lot yes, of our audience- I love it. Yes, a lot of our <laughs> audience was very interested to know about whether these were made with the coil method, uh, which is still used today. So thank you for touching mm -hmm. on that. And also the, the full length, the start to finish process of uh, looking at that. Um, so we're gonna ask you some questions um, that we have here for, that we received in advance. Um, one is, how did you find ways to work together um, remotely over the last year? How did you collaborate during shutdown? Yeah, thank goodness for Zoom and Google Meet. Um, and we're not being paid to say that, unfortunately. Um, no, it's <laughs> um, we, not Bobby an advertisement. Have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we, Bobby and I, um, have not yet had the pleasure of meeting in person, and I look forward to yeah. working on all our work together um, remotely. And we, I sent a lot of photos, and um, you know, did video conferencing as we from our storage and so Bobby could see the pots and from the installation, he was with us um, from Zuni, he was with us in the museum. So lots of phone calls and yeah. But he's gonna come it's out soon. <laughs> it has been fun and yeah, he's gonna come visit sure. us when he can. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, we can't wait to have you in person, Bobby, to see everything. That'll be wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Um, Bobby, I've got a question for you. How yeah. old were you when you first started making pottery? I was 14, I think. 14, yeah. And uh, I think when I when I learned that, I believe uh, in Hopi, they, my godfather taught me red pottery for, oh, just yellow pottery. And it was just plain. It was just making it. And then next was like your red, red wire. And that was just plain and then after that was like yellow and then with paints and stuff and so it was it's like a process you have to go through you can't just like learn the big stuff first you start off small and you work your way up that makes so much sense I'm sure that it's always <laughs> tantalizing to want to go for a big design um but you gotta oh. learn to walk before you can run um that's actually <laughs> yeah. related <laughs> related to another question mm -hmm. we received this one is um uh, from CL, who's with us this evening. Um, were all ceramics decorated or are some of the pieces utilitarian and made just for without decoration? Oh yeah, there's a difference between um, decoration pottery. Decorated pottery was more like for storing, like um, a great example would be like cornmeal seeds and stuff like something that was gonna be in the house. The jars were like painted, you know, and, um, uh, more elaborate for the for the house, you know, for for eyes to see. As for cooking, where it was more uh, roughly done, um, using a corrugated method, and um, using the same clays, but uh, with uh, uh, what what you might call it, um, that um, the sand. Um, there's like sand or temper in there, okay. and yeah. uh, it's uh, yeah, and it's added in there, and then it's uh, fired the same way, but it's it's roughly made. So there's to two different types of pottery that were made for for specific oh, use. That's great to know. It's an important difference. Yeah. Um, which um, maybe the, for both Hillary and Bobby, which is your favorite pot in the exhibition? Mm. Bobby, uh, I like. <laughs> yeah, I like <laughs> all of them. I like all of them because they're. They they also great examples of like history just in general. So it just you know, even even to 
the contemporary style now, you know, it just shows you kind of the evolution of pottery and where it's gone um, um, from the beginning to, to what it is now. So I just love them all. Anything to do with pottery, I love. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a hard choice for me. I love that, uh, that piece, um, that wall piece style uh, polychrome that has the wear on the edge. I just, one of the things that I love about this work that I get to do is the kind of the people and lives that are imbued in the objects and that wear is really beautiful to me. Um, yeah, so I'll just say that one. I have to say, well, I, really I, enjoyed... if, if I gotta pick a oh. piece. <laughs> <laughs> if I gotta pick a piece, I gotta choose um, <laughs> the one with the, with the bird. Um, but, uh, it's the colorful one. I can't even, it's one of those Sikyaki jars though, but it has the bird on there, the bird mo um, bird on there. But that's uh, probably one of my favorite ones because it's very abstract in design and has so much going on. Yeah, yeah. those ancestral pieces are incredible. Yeah. I love both the, um, when I went to see it in person, it was one of the first things I made sure I went to see when the DM reopened. And it's a beautiful installation. Um, I am equally fascinated by the canteen piece just because of how perfectly beautiful and round it is. Um, and also the Jean Sami's jar because it's so modern and new, um, but it has that great connection. So I really like, it's wonderful to hear you talk about how that came to be. Thanks for sharing your favorites, Danielle. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see, other questions. Um, oh, this one's interesting. What are, this is from Arthur B, who's here with us tonight. What are your thoughts about why broken pottery is so common at the Mesa sites? Question, Arthur. Mm, that is a very good question. Um, a lot of it is just like, you know, well, each um, ruin site, um, um, especially after they, they just left them and then went up to the top, um, uh, they left. I mean, each village has like, um, I guess, trash middens, but um, it seems like when the people just got up and left, they left like a lot of pottery just in general around. But um, it seems like around the whole edging of like the Hopi um, villages, um, they're just covered with um, pottery shards like all the way around. So like they were just, you know, dumping the pottery, you know, after it's being done, um, serving its purpose you know they they just kind of dumped them and usually you can find them like even farther from like if you just like I used to go on walks and I would find like really big pieces like way far and um so I think it's it depends on, on where these pots went and how they were used so um maybe somebody like was walking you know or taking food somewhere and they dropped a jar and it broke and they just left it there so like it depends on how it was used <laughs> Also, I am, um, you know, I don't know if this is a factor, but I just kind of reflecting on things that you and have told me, Bobby, and that others have commented on. Also, people don't necessarily, when you come across a pot shard, like the one that you shared the picture of, you look at it and then leave it back, back where it was, right? You don't take it with you. And so I think that's also part of it is that they, people don't, yeah, leave them where they sit. And so they're still with us. Right. And that's a, that's a very amazing thing too, especially for um, non payo to kind of get these designs. I know um, her brother and I'm kind of drew designs for her too, but a lot of them, she just in my memory kind of stuck with her. And um, it's starting to get like that with me too. Like I can remember a lot of symbolism now. Um, and then you just kind of um, pick it out of your library in your mind and incorporate it onto your pot. So this a lot of, uh, you know, having that kind of same mindset, the artistic mindset of how they created uh, pottery in that time. Um, you, that's kind of like how I put my mindset in, into uh, creating uh, these old designs that uh, I come up with. Uh, um, when I say style of, of, of pottery designs that they did a long time ago. Thank you. We have a question from Denise M about the clay itself. She's curious about the yellow, yellow ochre color. How is it made? And is the color the color from the clay or is it a colored slip? 
Um, it's from a uh, it's from a clay. Uh, it's, it's usually found in pockets. Um, yellow is kind of uh, found in different areas compared to the gray. Sometimes it's found together. Um, so it kind of depends on, on on how it's located, but it has a lot of iron in it. So, um, but it's yellow in color, like golden yellow. But um, when fired, it turns um, like kind of like a rust red. Um, but those can be found in, in certain areas. And usually in Hopi, I think um, there's a place uh, where Hopi potters get that yellow from specifically. Mm. And for the, the, the ancestral wear, some of the kind of that rich hue also comes from the firing technique, right? Right, right, right. So the lignite coal firing technique is a longer, hotter firing that, that produces a different texture to a porcelain, more porcelain kind of texture. And, and it gives us that, that rich yellow hue. Right. Let's see, here's another one. This one's from Judy S. Um, who I saw in the chat earlier. Can you interpret some of the designs uh, that we've seen tonight? You described the eagle feather and the cloud. Are there others or a good source that you would recommend to learn about these? Mm, yeah, um, there's this many designs. I mean, um, Hopi, Hopi pottery designs are, are, uh, are, a bit, are pottery mode design motives are usually consist of like birds, um, clouds, feathers, um, even um, just, um, um, I guess, visually too, they were painting people on there. So it's kind of something that they saw in everyday life. Um, and that, that goes all the way through, um, even um, when the, the Kachina society kind of starts to come around. Um, and then they paint basically what they see and that's flowers, birds, everything. So, but they, they um, kind of uh, put it in like an abstract form and, and then, um, uh, which is really unique because uh, sometimes um, to this person, you know, when you go in and you look at pottery, you know, um, and this is what I was explaining to um, Hillary too, is sometimes you have to go, you know, in and look at the designs and really just kind of observe them because um, they're, they're really simple. I mean, if you look at them, they're really easy to kind of, uh, they tell you uh, a simple story and it's usually just, you know, something that's very common sense with like prayers for rain and stuff like that. And you just, I guess, gotta have an eye for it. But a lot of them just consist of birds, feathers and clouds and and the corn, especially. You'll see like little objects of corn and, and, and pottery. And that's something that they always put there because that's something that's very important in uh, Pueblo, Pueblo life. And Kachina too. Yes, and Kachina too. Great, thank you so much. We have time for one more question. I'm gonna give this one for Bobby. Um, do you make any other kinds of art besides pottery? Uh, yeah, I am a, I weave textiles, um, I weave basketry um, and, hmm. And I sew too. Um, I sew Pueblo attire as well too. So that's one. You're amazing. Very talented. And you're a curator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this has been a great experience. So I love it. Thank you for sharing it with us, Bobby. It's very. It's our privilege to get to hear from you today. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you guys. I really, I really love it. It's a really great experience for me. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you both so much. Um, this in-depth look at Nampeo and the Sikyaki revival was a really fascinating presentation. Um, I loved hearing all of these details. Um, a big thank you to all of our members who joined us tonight. Thank you for sticking with us. I know we went a little bit over um, because there was so much good information to cover. Um, there is a poll that is going to pop up on your screen here. Um, and we encourage you to share your feedback with us here so that we can um, keep making great events for you. Um, I'm happy to share too that the Legion of Honor has now reopened. And if you're able to plan a visit, we have two wonderful exhibitions now on view. Wangechi Mutu, I Am Speaking, Are You Listening? And The Last Supper in Pompeii. 
Tickets are available for advanced reservation. Um, note that you do want to reserve a time ticket that's required for entry right now so that we can plan for you to have a great visit. And we highly recommend booking in advance. Thank you so much. I hope you're able to take the poll here on the event. And this event is recorded and will be shared out later. So you'll be able to share it or watch it again, should you wish. Have a great evening, everyone. We're so happy you joined us tonight. Thank you so much. Bye.